in Jim's case, he had an ability to absorb massive amounts of drugs without any apparent deleterious effect, especially on his playing. His playing never faltered. Keltner tells the story of Jim coming backstage with a handful of Owsley LSD tabs and Keltner breaking off a little piece and taking a little piece of one and Jim gobbling down a whole pill. And then they go out to play and Keltner can't even remember what rhythm is. And Jim is on it. He's playing and he's looking over at Keltner and screaming, play, play. <laughs> and Keltner finally just got up, left and burst into tears. <laughs> Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on on possibly the greatest drummer who ever lived, Jim Gordon, Psst. along with our very special guest, author and Jim Gordon biographer, Joel Selvin. Coming up, we've got Deer Tick, Bob Nastanovich, Mike Watt rating the entirety of the Minutemen's output, and the Association rating the entirety of their own output over the course of an epic 13-hour interview. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. Go ahead, do it! And away we go then with Joel Selvin as we race through the stark, cubist mental state of the talented and tragically troubled Jim Gordon. All-American apple pie young man, perfectly on beat both behind the kit and in his day-to-day, -day, turns, well, schizophrenically induced matricidal murderer. Tonight's guest literally wrote the book on Jim Gordon. It comes out in February, and I can't wait to crack it open and sniff down its floridly scented contents. This guy had a legendary column in the San Francisco Chronicle that ran from 1972 to 2009. In addition to books on Ricky Nelson, Ed Hardy, The Grateful Dead, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Red, My Uncensored Life in Rock with Sammy Hagar. Not to mention two books of his that I've read and can vouch for because they're mind blowers. Altamont, The Rolling Stones, The Hells Angels, and The Inside Story of Rock's Darkest Day, which is an essential companion to Gimme Shelter, and Sly and the Family Stone, An Oral History, which is as good a compendium of pages as I've read in a while. The man's doing the Lord's work, yet he's taking time out to do a Drum Pounders Deluxe Deep Dive. Give this badass scribe a bit of your love, because he surely deserves it. Lads and ladies, Joel Selvin. My, my. <laughs> Come on. Every intro of Joel Selvin should be that exclamatory, no? You know, whatever. Just pass the peas. <laughs> I will say that your Sly and the Family Stone book, it really fucked me up. I mean, you know, after I was done reading that, I was a Sly fan from the start, and I was always of the mind. From when I was a teenager, I read Mystery Train, and I read the Sly chapter over and over and over again at 14 years old. And I'm thinking, from small talk on, it sounds like it's all garbage. And then I heard it for myself, and I was like, with each preceding one, no, this guy remained a genius throughout his whole life. It wasn't like it's all as good as Riot, but the story that history perceives is incorrect. And I actually started to attempt to make a documentary about Sly, and then actually wrote a fiction feature, because I'm a filmmaker, that is kind of based on what he went through with uh, PCP and what is it, 824 Bel Air Road, 832? Something Whatever. like that. I've scaled that fucking wall and just sat up there and looked at the premises. You're a great writer and your excitement about music, it really comes across. So this book is a big deal for me, as it should be for everyone else. The Sly Stone book that you speak so highly of, I think we should note, is an oral history. And the fact is that that book really belongs to the people who told me their stories. Their accounts are so vivid and so lucid and so candid 
intended that they really deserve the credit here. I was the guy that channeled them and that edited the transcripts. But the assemblage is masterful because you probably wound up with a fuckload of stuff. And so to whittle that down in a way that's consumable. I don't know how much was on the cutting room floor. I used all the good stuff. There were heroes in that project, like Hamp Banks, that yeah. I, I can't credit enough. But I'm with you on the Sly Stone book. It's, it's, it's truly a remarkable piece of work. And I feel comfortable saying that, given that, you know, my role is kind of facilitator of that book. You know, that brings up a really interesting point, because if you just did oral histories, you could go around saying, I just wrote the greatest book, and you won't be uh, considered an asshole because it's everyone else they wrote it, right? I had the opportunity to talk over the oral history deal right about the time I was working on the sly. I can't remember whether I just finished it or was just about to start it, but right there with George Plimpton. Oh, wow. And that's the man who knows about the oral history. And he recommended the Thomas Hauser book on Muhammad Ali. And I don't know if you've read that or are aware of it, but it is absolutely, without question, the textbook oral history. And what greater story in our lifetime to tell than the life of Muhammad Ali? Sure. Yeah, uh, Plimpton was was very helpful and w really happy to get under the hood and talk about the whole mechanics of it and why it works. And then later, I had the opportunity to tackle the Sly Stone story insofar as the album Riot going on for Mojo Magazine, using the same quotes from the interviews that I had done for the book. Are you talking about the Dick Cavett Show article? Yeah, that's in there, yeah. Okay, so that article, it's probably the greatest article I've ever read in Mojo Magazine. It's so <laughs> insane. I've read it so many times, and when I did the three-part episode of Sly at the beginning of our gestation, I repurchased that magazine. I had to track it down in France and buy a copy. 2000 one who can forget the date you know, uh, you know what i was say, doing when 9 11 happened i was listening to ain't but the one way i was going to say i tackled this for mojo magazine and i felt that my efforts they, they were sufficient they weren't insufficient but they didn't match the power of hearing it strictly from the voices of the people that goes back to dance to the music though doesn't it listen to the voices right right and I, I could i could go down this rabbit hole with you for the next two hours but of course we have to take a sharp left here because i want to talk with you about another obsession of yours you uh, obviously are a jewish man with a darkness just like myself or else there's no way we'd be on the zoom call with each other tell me about this darkness in yourself that doesn't allow you to listen to, to acts like katrina and the waves and just suffice with the sunshine i'm okay with you know happy face music but there's no story there right and I'm a writer. My stock and trade is stories. I do gravitate toward the dark stories, the noir, uh, you know, Burt Burns and the Gangsters, uh, Sly Stone and his uh, criminal friends, uh, Altamont and the Hells Angels, even Hollywood Eden, which is my book about the origins of the Los Angeles pop music scene. It kind of, you know, skirts toward the dark side of things. So I like shadowy pastels. What can I say? How long of an obsession? I'm going I'm to guess it's an obsession have you had with Jim Gordon? And when did you know this was I, the I, book that you, that you were going to do? I first tumbled to the idea of this being a book about 1994, when I, I made a, an initial sort of run at doing something with this after I'd written Summer of Love. It wasn't going to be, but I sort of put it on a shelf and let it just sit there. And I picked it back up about a little over three years ago. Okay. Deep storage. And, you know, I know you didn't actually get to I don't know how I got through to Jim. And, and of course, this is like 10 years ago, but I tracked him down. At first, he didn't take my call. Then we just had a brief conversation where I said, is this uh, Jim Gordon, the drummer? And he said, that was a long time ago. It wasn't much more than that. I wish I could say it was, you know, an endless conversation. But, you know, I'm so uh, crazed over this guy's work and his story that I went up tracking down Renee Armand, his ex-wife, and uh, getting to know her her and she as you know is a lovely delightful person so you know i'm hoping that far from this episode or episodes putting this obsession to bed 
giving it context or maybe helping make sense of it all a little bit with you. You're actually, even though you're the biographer, through this whole process of the last few weeks, you've been trying to keep me under control. Like, dude, let's not talk about every last thing he ever did. <laughs> let's let's keep a, a vice-like grip on the narrative, shall we? I am come from the newspaper world. The best advice I ever got about writing a newspaper article came from the managing editor, Gordon Pates, who told me that he didn't consider a sports story worth a shit unless you knew the final score by the end of the first paragraph. Right, right. <laughs> you know, toward that way of thinking, this is not a completist track. Even though this is a completist show, if we did a completist thing on Jim Gordon, we would alienate 99.5% of the audience. Let me show you something, Dave. I have right here. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, shit. So you're holding up a pile of pages. There's a union contract. Each one of these is a recording session that Jim Gordon played on. It lists the studio, the hours, the producer, the name of the songs, all the other people who are playing on the session, their addresses, their social security numbers. And this is about, I don't know, half of Jim's union career. All the non-union dates are not reflected with union contracts. But I'm holding up a stack of what, like three? or four inches. Yeah. I, I think there's about a thousand contracts in here. That's crazy. And each one of them, three or four songs. Right. So you're looking at Jim playing on 3,000 songs here. Yeah, that, that's insane. So, yeah. So, Joel, you and I will do a, a year by year thing. And in fact, I've compartmentalized every year, kind of naming each year, like, here's what happened in his career, mainly like from 65 to 79. So we're going to highlight certain songs and records which feel crucial in telling the tale so that you get a full sense of the scope of how much Jim Gordon accomplished in his 20 years as a professional drummer. I think it's 15 years. 15 years? Oh, yeah, yeah. He starts in 1963 and he's done in 78. Well, 79, right? I mean, you're really, you know, if it, it, the stuff he did in 79, 80 and 81, it's nothing. It doesn't even well, count. His uh, drum solo as Animal to me is the epilogue of his career. It wow. is the epilogue. So I consider 79 because of that. But we could duke it out He's later. He's playing on a cartoon. Give me a break, you know? Yeah, That's but, a long way from a Streisand session. Uh, it, it is, but it's the first Muppet movie. It counts. All right, so I want the audience to feel what it's like to get caught up, caught up in and run over by the locomotive thing that is the Jim Gordon style. So toward that end, I want to, you know, actually keep an eye on the pacing and move quick. Jim's life, to me, when I look over all his work and everything, it feels like the final scene in Goodfellas. And of course, two of the songs in that final scene, Jim's on. And so I would love to convey that sort of breathlessness. All right. So here's the run up, what I endearingly call the section that gets us to the first ever thing he did. So Jim was raised in the San Fernando Valley of LA, went to Grant High School. His mother, Osa, was a nurse. Dad was an accountant. What's his dad? Dad's name? John, but he was known as Jack. So he was an accountant who I'm guessing instilled in Gordon that sort of all American, you know, keeping track of every last expenditure in his date book sort of methodology of living. Jack was an alcoholic who uh, was a very problematic father up until when Jim was about 13 years old when his father entered Alcoholics Anonymous. They had an older brother, about two years older than him, and they were raised in a highly repressive, buttoned down, you know, middle class house in what was at the time a very leafy suburb of Hollywood. It was not the San Fernando Valley that we've come to know. It was the San Fernando Valley in the 50s, where there were plenty of empty lots and persimmon groves, and, uh, you know, it's just a different world. Is there any inkling at all that there's going to be any kind of psychological issues with Jim at this early stage? You never can put your finger on where that sort of stuff begins. But the the evidence is that, that Jim lived in his own head to a great degree beginning in childhood. And where that blooms into some kind of psychotic behavior, it's really hard to say. A lot of the struggles were interior. They were just in Jim's head and he lived with them all by himself. And we can't really know until they emerge in, in action in deeds and 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 you, and you say ah oh, look that guy's crazy you don't know how long he's been battling those forces and how long it's been brewing inside his own mind right 
I know as far as his proclivity towards keeping a beat that he made his first set of drums out of garbage cans and then his parents bought him a real set soon after that. In high school, he worked whatever gigs he could he could get, weddings, bar mitzvahs, parties. And then his first band was Frankie Knight and the Jesters and they played the Hollywood club circuit and began to attract attention, which is what brought the Everly Brothers sniffing, right? Yeah, Frankie Knight and the Jesters did a lot of Hollywood gigs. It was his high school friend, Mike Post, who would eventually become famous for writing TV theme songs, who brought Jim into the band. And then uh, Joey Page, the bass player and musical director of the Everly Brothers, saw the band and instantly recognized 17-year-old Jim Gordon. The Everly Brothers were getting ready for a summer tour in England around 63, and they wanted Gordon to be their drummer. His parents disapproved. The pay wasn't very high, and he actually passed up a music scholarship to UCLA in order to begin doing this. Is that right? He uh, had been thinking about going to college and, and becoming a music teacher. His girlfriend was doing chorus line dancing in casinos in Reno and Las Vegas. And so she'd started her show business career. Joe? Joe Habibe? Yeah, something like that. And uh, the Everly Brothers thing just sort of came out of nowhere and it, it would have been irresistible to Jim. The Everly Brothers at that time were pretty much the last rock and roll act from the 50s that was still standing. They were one of the legitimate certified greats of the era. So yeah, that was an incredible launching pad for Jim. And his parents would not allow him to take the job unless he agreed to go to college. And there was scholarships on the table from both UCLA and Valley State. And he did sign up for Valley State. I don't know if there was a scholarship involved, but I mean, it was a state college and it's not like there was a huge tuition or anything. And that lasted not a full semester. The summer tour was of the U.S. It was a pretty grueling long tour. And then in September, just after he started school, they went to England. And there they were on a tour with Bo Diddley, Little Richard, and a group out of London that had never played outside of London had a small record up in the mid charts called the Rolling Stones. They were the opening act. Nice. So when he got back from England in October of 63, he dropped out of college and devoted himself to being a professional musician full time. What was his flashpoint moment of creative epiphany? Did he have anything that happened to him or an experience where he was like, this is it? He was in a marching band called the Robin Hood Band, which had 75 members. They wore green tunics and pointy hats, and they were sponsored by the International Order of Foresters. Rose Bowl parade, public events, uh, that kind of stuff. And that was him at age 15, having already gotten all the training and book learning. He was adept at sight reading. He'd been taking Bach homework on the marimba from a UCLA professor. He, he studied with Cubby O'Brien's dad and this Robin Hood band, apparently, which is where he met Jill, his girlfriend, uh, that sealed his ambition to become a professional musician. Okay. W which leads us into the first phase of his career, which I'm going to affectionately call Skippy, 1963 to 69. And this is, of course, Frank Zappa's nickname for him because he was such an all-American boy. He notated every last cent that he spent, kept track of everything, was tidy as can be. It's like uh, the crazy person is always cleaning up their house, thinking that that's going to solve everything. All right, so he's uh, traveling England with the Everly Brothers, and in 64, he marries Jill. What's interesting about the marriage to Jill is right as his career takes off, that's when the marriage ends. It's almost like when you lay all the events of his life out, that just the gesture of he and Jill breaking up was what let some of the forces of those voices in of course it's easy to say from afar but literally she's gone and then delaney and bonnie right yeah and i i don't see it quite the same way to me he'd already had an incredible career he played on numerous big hit records he'd been in sessions with the biggest names of the industry at that point he'd played all over good vibrations and wichita linemen and classical gas and on and on and on what what then happened at the time that he broke up with his wife was that he had experienced so much success and he felt 
constrained by his domestic situation. He wanted to spend some of the capital. And that's where these live bands came in. And he started with Delaney and Bonnie. He hadn't really been on the bandstand outside of a few dates with Chad and Jeremy, of all things, uh, since the Everly Brothers. I don't want to get into Delaney and Bonnie quite yet, because we haven't even started with Dino, Desi, and Billy. Well, the Delaney and Bonnie thing, the whole period of his of his career where he became a live performing musician belonging to bands, that's like a second act. So in 1965, I call this year Jim Gets His Feet Wet. Outside of the Everly Brothers, and by the way, this is the very first time where the guest has provided the playlist, which I really appreciate. It's an awesome playlist. It's like four hours long. I've got a place in Vermont, so when I drive from Jersey to Vermont, it's literally the exact amount of time to get there. The whole thing kicks off with Love is Strange by the Everly Brothers, and with that loping beat and sort of relaxed cowpoke saunter, it's not the gym that we come to know in a few years so this is my favorite version of this song this is a great song i love it and the dino desi and billy from that year i'm a fool not quite sure if he's on the whole record or not but i'm a fool is like a bubblegum pop louis louis redux i think jim's drumming on i'm a fool is the beginning of where he starts rewriting the way studio drums are played it's embedded in the composition it's not timekeeping it goes into the chorus it comes out of the verse He's got all kinds of little controlled explosions and all his intuition, all this brilliant imaginative intuition is very much there. Yeah. And to me, a lot of this stuff that Jim does and why his playing is so unique and so different from anybody else's is because of the electrochemical setup in his brain. And we know that that's going to become disturbed and staticky as he gets older. But I'm convinced that the original vision that he had of how drums worked was a product of that. I mean, there's an aspect, if you can get the timing right, then you have control. And when he wasn't pounding the skins, it sounds like he didn't have very much control at all. So I can see the appeal for sure. And probably the most positive thing to happen to him was Hal Blaine getting extremely busy in the mid-60s because all the overspills started going to Jim. Isn't that right? Al uh, gave Jim a lot of work. Mike Post got Jim a lot of work. Lee Hazelwood got Jim a lot of work. As soon as people heard Jim, they wanted him to play on their records. He just had that kind of incandescent appeal, and nobody had ever heard anybody play drums like that. Is so, ahead, 1965 is the beginning of him playing sessions. 1966, I mean, he is arm in arm on par with Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine at that point. The yeah. records he played on in 66 are just phenomenal. It's crazy. I mean, at this point, it's still super early in his career and he is pushing his way to the front of the pop ranks. The most remarkable has got to be, I'm waiting for the day on Pet Sounds. I mean, he's a year into his studio drumming career, and he's on one of the greatest records of all time, very front and center, too. He's also- How about orange juice bottles on God Only Knows? Right. I'm waiting for the day. The timpani is Gary Coleman, a very well-known Hollywood session musician, but that's Jim on the kit, and the timpani and the kit just explode that track. But Hal was behind the kit, as he usually was at Beach Boys Sessions when they started cutting God Only Knows, and Jim was on additional percussion. And that's where he razor-bladed open plastic orange juice bottles and tuned them and clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop orange juice bottles. You put that track up and listen to it now. You'll hear those orange juice bottles. They follow Hal Blaine's drum part, and they light up the track. So Brian Wilson, right? Orange juice bottles. But Caroline No, they're very front and center in Caroline No. Those same bottles. I'm not aware of Jim being on Caroline No, but I haven't okay. seen the contract for that. Maybe he's uh, not. But we know that Brian Wilson's predilection for citrus and for California orange art from that time, so it's no surprise he gravitated toward that as percussion. River Deep Mountain High, is that him on the kit? No, that's Earl Palmer on the kit. He's shaking bells. There uh, were about uh, 30 musicians on that track. I mean, that song is completely insane. It's amazing he's on it. I think one of the most underrated things... Day after a Beach Boys session. Nuts. I mean, the guy was on one wonderful record after another. He played on a bunch of incredible Merle Haggard sessions, and then the next day was playing on Glenn Campbell's uh, Gentle on My Mind. I mean, it just goes on and on. 
His country career is kind of interesting. They were sideline, I should say. So in 66, it was Merle Haggard's The Bottle Let Me Down. And then in 67, I'm a Lonesome Fugitive. How much country did Jim partake in? Because this early, more relaxed work of his is actually a really super appealing sideline corollary of his career. Yeah, he loved playing jazz too. So like the Mel Torme sessions and stuff like that was stuff he liked. I don't know how much country he did as much as there was a call for. But Merle Haggard was a particular client. Merle was just about two chart records into his career, two or three, when they decided to bring in James Burton and Glenn Campbell on guitar. And it was Burton who said, let's bring Jim Gordon in with us. And at that point, Merle pretty much adopted Gordon. And Jim's on just so many of the great Merle Haggard records. That's him on Mama Tried. That's him on the Jimmy Rogers stuff. But that's true of Campbell, too, by the way. Campbell played tons of Merle Haggard sessions. And get this, he's singing harmony on Today I Started Love you again. Glenn Campbell, he's on Dance, Dance, Dance by the Beach Boys, Strangers in the Night by Frank Sinatra, and the Merle Haggard, Today I Started Loving You Again. These guys were making so so much music, so much different kinds of music, and they were all enthusiastic about it. It wasn't like these were Nashville guys looking down their nose at rock and roll or New York guys looking down their nose at R&B. They were young and they were open to the possibilities of everything. It was a very California scene. And my God, I mean, the records that they were turning out, Nancy Sinatra, Sonny and Cher, all the Phil Spector stuff, all the Beach Boys stuff, Jan and Dean, Glenn Campbell, all the folk rock yeah. stuff. I mean, it just exploded I mean, in creativity. Yeah. And these same musicians were playing on everything, whether it's Harry Nielsen or the Birds. Yeah. I mean, I, I had Don Randy on, too, and talking about the scope of what he did, too, is equally nuts. So in 67... harpsichord on the Stone Ponies' different drum, right, right. which Jim's on drums. And he said uh, that after that, he got all the harpsichord calls. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like uh, Al Cooper after Like a Rolling Stone. The first time he ever played the organ, all of a sudden he's the go-to guy. So in 67, his career really takes off. He's on a rich variety of staggeringly diverse pop songs. The Beat Goes On, Gary Puckett's Woman Woman, Gentle On My Mind, which I believe was supposed to only be a demo, but it turned out to be an absolutely perfect demo, which was followed up uh, in 68 by Wichita Lineman. Did he play the entirety of the Bo Brummel's Triangle? Yeah, there's no other drummer on that record. Okay, that's and, and and by the way, John Peterson, the Bo Brummel's drummer, who had left the Bo Brummel's to join Harper's Bazaar, he didn't play on those tracks either, and Jim did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, L Lenny Warnocker, the record producer, he didn't go into the studio for years without Jim. Uh, yeah, Triangle is an absolute masterpiece, way up there for me for Jim in 67. Different drum is a great example of Jim sublimating that locomotive thing he does to the majesty of that perfect Nesmith top line. The melody is great. It, he doesn't take over the song. He can lay back in the pocket, but he does it in an inimitable way. Then Song Cycle by Van Dyke Parks and later Discover America and Gene Clark with the Gosden Brothers. These are classic records, one after the other, two to three dates a day, six days a week, right? Yeah. Pulling down huge money, 21 years old, making more money than his parents combined, working all the time except Sunday. And his wife has now landed a job on TV dancing for this Dick Clark show called Where the Action Is. And so she's out six days a week dancing on location where the show was shot. Dancing on sands, apparently a bitch. And she said, you got sunburned a lot. I mean, th this is all the beginnings of a cultural explosion emanating from Southern California yeah. that rolled out in the mid 60s, 64, 65, and then just blew up behind the birds and Buffalo Springfield and Johnny Rivers, of all things, uh, mamas and papas. Suddenly, what had been a very small, remote outpost on the faraway West Coast was now with London, the global center of the pop music world. 
Yeah. You mentioned the birds. I think one of his first releases of 68 is unquestionably one of my favorite records of all time and objectively the greatest birds record. Notorious Bird Brothers is absolutely perfect. And is that him just on Wasn't Born to Follow? No, it's him on going back with that slam into the final chorus. I think he's all over it. They brought Hal Blaine in for like one track because Jim was too busy. But yeah, uh, they, they, they fired Michael Clark during the sessions. He He'd been their drummer since the very beginning. And uh, you can hear, by the way, on a bonus track at the end, him getting kicked out of the band, basically. Yeah, they reported a lot of that stuff. But uh, yeah, Jim was just fit in just perfectly to that, and that record was finished. They fired Crosby like a couple weeks later, and the, yeah, the yeah. record was finished by you know these Hollywood session musicians. Well, Gene Clark was in there for a blip too. They, I don't know who you know who uh, who was all on the whole thing, but I know they brought Paul Beaver in, and and he was the early guy on the Moog synthesizer. Yeah. They had uh, a steel guitar player in there. They had a harpist. And they didn't know what they were doing. They were just throwing stuff against the wall to see what stuck. Born Out of Chaos is the absolute... Me- I was 14 years old in high school, and I was writing the Notorious Bird Brothers on the cover of my Trapper Keeper. No one had any idea what the fuck I was talking about at that time. This is the 1980s. Nobody gave a shit about that. Uh, all right, so in 68, we've got Notorious Bird Brothers, Buffalo Springfield's Expecting to Fly, which there's some weird time signature stuff in there i can even though i always try to keep time with jim for decades now i've never been able to successfully do it tiptoe through the tulips by tiny tim classical gas dream a little dream of me who knows where the time goes harry nelson's everybody's talking which i mean just that breezy shuffle alone uh, you could have a whole episode about and then the staggering grazing in the grass by the friends of distinction which is a true stunner and you want to talk complex that's a complex song to play yeah he's slamming right from the downbeat on that one and every note was charted out in advance and he had to find his own sort of place in the chart it's kind of brilliant but the power of that track is it's just explosive and of course that's king arison on uh congas that he and jim would later combine on the incredible bongo band too so that was kind of significant and by 1967 the hollywood session players had just developed into some unreal level of virtuosity and their values were to serve to elaborate to embellish they they weren't there to be in the in the center of the frame they were there to to lift other people up and so you know just look at the people you rattled off i mean uh, i mean here's jim he's doing a gary puckett session with 26 musicians one day next day he's doing a merle haggard session right i feel like the most significant thing that he did in 68 i could be wrong about this in terms of how i assessed it i think since he hit the big time and became this master session musician that the city is the first band that he joined is that correct i think those were just sessions did they ever gig i don't think so uh, i don't I, I, I don't think so no his picture's not on the cover it's just the three right. guys uh, or right. Carol and the two guys. And I think he was just the session drummer. He plays some demos for Tapestry later that year, but he's he's not on the, the master city, tracks. The City's fantastic. I've, I've loved yeah, that a good record for a long time. It's funny. I've heard a lot of covers of Snow Queen and everybody fucks it up. And the reason they fuck it up is because they don't have that gentle supple touch that jim does he allows the track to simmer in a way that uh, another great band that i absolutely love is the association but they cover this song and there's absolutely no subtlety to it ted bluchel comes out with no understanding of the subtlety of the dynamics of it and a lot of the versions i've heard of snow queen are like that that is just the first song there's a staggering array of great material on that record i think jim's playing was always compositional he he was not a timekeeper, although he had perfect time, but he saw the drums as a whole instrument and he worked to embed his drum parts in the infrastructure of the music, in the composition of it. And, and that's the trick of the session musician that Jim's intuition gave him this incredible advantage in. Right. Because he had learned all these styles so he could chameleonize himself, right? He knew how to do everything. He'd played with the Burbank Symphony as a teenager. He'd played with the Paige Cavanaugh band, which was an out-and-out jazz band. The guy whose place he took was Henry Mancini's drummer. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, thoroughly versed in, in the whole realm of modern American music from 
you know, symphonic down to, you know, little jazz combos. Is this the part of his career then where he was so busy that he would fly to LA from Vegas every day to do two or three recording sessions and then hit the evening show at Caesars Palace by the evening? He did a long run at Caesars with Andy Williams in 67 and was splitting up with his wife. So he really wanted to be out of town. And yeah, he, w- he would fly in and do daytime sessions and then go back and hit the bands down at night yeah that's pretty nuts so he's like fly, he's flying every day from vegas to la vegas to la i don't know i don't know how, how, how much he was doing that from what i can tell the session slacked off while he was in vegas before he went to vegas he was doing sessions every day and then you know the couple months he was in vegas with andy they're more like three a week and then second part of 69 is a whole different story first part of 69 is jim feeling himself before the cannon blast of delaney and bonnie and Uh, So what that really equates to uh, is a a couple of really cool sessions, but also his own solo album, which you hit me to. And he was co-drummer of the first Bread album. Let's talk about the solo record, which is, you know, not extremely noteworthy, but at least he did one. It came out in April 69. Jimmy Gordon and his jazz and pops band Hog Fat. There's a second album out of those same sessions called Spontaneous Combustion. It's not a Jim Gordon record. But it's the same band. It's just the you know those guys: Mike Melvin on keyboards, Don Peak on guitar, Tom Scott on on saxophone, Gary Coleman on additional percussion. It's just it's the guys he played music with every day in the studio with Bob Thiel, who was a real laissez-faire record producer, jazzbo out of the jazz world, yeah, yeah. right? You know, yeah, man, that's close enough. And I think they cut those two albums in three days. I'm surprised it took that long, honestly. Well, it was 18 songs, you know. It was just- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's good stuff, man. I appreciate you uh, telling me about that. The Bread album I like. I like Bread before they really knew exactly what they were and went, you know, whole hog into the soft rock direction. Also, Arlo Guthrie's coming into Los Angeles. And, you know, most surprisingly, because I thought it was Dallas Taylor, is Marrakesh Express by CSN. That drum figure is fantastic. That sort of skipping valedictory run that he does. No idea that that was Jim. Well, it certainly doesn't sound like anybody else, uh, uh, like any other track on that record does it no it doesn't jim's fingerprints are just so identifiable and you've been listening to him for a while now i'm sure it's it's, it's jumping out at you too because there's these i don't know what you call them keltner called it a bounce but it's it's just the way he handles the interior rhythms between the one and the four and the way he divides time is is, is so deeply personal it's just not the kind of rigid division of time that most drummers aspire to he's I- so confident in his command of the world of rhythm that he He's into microtones and microbeats, and and it, it, it's it's truly intuition-led drumming. So when you think of Jim, what's the first song or image that comes to you? I mean, there's got to be one thing. E. That's- w. Stevenson, My Maria. That track. Yep. For me, it's probably that locomotive thing that he does for Only You Know and I Know, the Dave Mason version, or anything on Mad Dogs. I I think of that locomotive train thing that he does. That's the paradiddle on Delaney and Bonnie's Only You Know and I Know, where the stop breaks, he just pulls out of the track, and the whole thing just falls apart while Leon hits the keyboard. And then Jim comes back in with the paradiddle and ties it all back together. That's an amazing track. And then a month later, he goes in the studio and redoes the song with Dave Mason and totally reinvents the rhythm track to the song. It's truly remarkable. Um, Paradiddle is the number one Jim Gordon move. It's marching band stuff. You know, you don't see Charlie Watts paradiddling. It doesn't go with the blues band thing. But Jim incorporates it so skillfully and so thoroughly in all his work. Layla's riddled with paradiddle. So correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm not a musician, but uh, paradiddle is really all about filling up all the space, right? It's about saturation. Paradiddle is a double stroke repeated on both sticks. So it's really, in a sense, an absence of subtlety and a proliferation of pure energy, right? I would think it's more like a fine point stitching that has to be delivered absolutely perfectly and has to be drilled. A lot of paradiddle stuff is really sloppy and uh, smears the beat and calls attention to itself. In Jim's case, it's like applying a drill. 
and he's in total command and control of it. So I think it's more nuanced than, than anything. Okay. So when did he have his daughter? And did you speak with her for the book? The family has been incredibly supportive of my work without wanting to be involved in it. Okay. No, they have been severely traumatized by Jim's illness. I completely understand and support them in that. On the other hand, that doesn't mean I haven't been in touch with them. The daughter is in her 50s. She lives in Switzerland. Uh, you know, it's been a lifetime for her. She was a very close to her grandmother. Was she at all close with Jim? Jim was a very difficult father. He didn't really have the skills to connect with people. That is a symptom of his condition. Okay, so so Jim and Jill, they're, they're done now. Just in time for phase two to go down, which is top of the world, ma... 1969 to 1974, really the latter part of 1969 to 72, Jim was white hot and untouchable. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul bearing interview with that week's special guest or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all. Discographies, the private press with Paul Major. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discography. Just in time for phase two to go down, which is top of the world, ma. 1969 to 1974, really the latter part of 1969 to 72, Jim was white hot and untouchable. I mean, in an almost unparalleled way where I've never really seen anyone just skate like a rock skipping over a pond from thing to thing to thing. Just it's like life's got him carried to all the top of the heap sessions and stages. One of our most longtime listeners, David Tabachman, wanted me to ask you jim gordon became a road drummer at the peak of his earning potential as a session player did he just have a love of the road or did they pay him the big bucks 125 dollars a week was what delaney and bonnie paid him he was making that by the hour in the studio what was his reasoning then was it just aesthetic so 1969 dave making records was no longer the coolest thing in the music business being in a rock band was led zeppelin was brand new and their two and a half hour show included a half hour drum solo from John Bonham. The Who were touring with Keith Moon on drums and they were and they were playing the whole Tommy thing. And then that's the year the Stones came back. Suddenly the glamour and the glory, the whole action of the scene it shifted from the studios to the stages. Right. And Jim caught on to this Delaney and Bonnie thing and it faulted him into the royal court of british rock and they'd never seen anything like that over there really i mean the level of that stuff in england it just wasn't on a par with what was going on on the west coast so gordon shows up with delaney and bonnie and eric clapton and george harrison just go wow what is that and and everybody that got on stage with Jim felt the same way. It's how this guy could wrap his drums around you and hug you and lift you up as a guitarist, as a singer, as a any kind of musician in the band. And he did it with orchestration, not volume. He did it with understanding the compositional elements of the percussion. He was one of a kind. Yeah. So he shows up in London at the point when London was the middle of the pop music world. The Beatles had just broken up. George Harrison was starting his solo album. And who's on drums? Oh, Ringo's on drums. But Ringo has to leave town. Delaney and Bonnie, everyone was flocking there. You had George Harrison, you know, sort of keeping his head down on stage, just wanted to, you know, groove in a band. You had a rhythm section that would soon become the rhythm section of some of the most important music 
music ever made. And it all coalesced around Delaney and Bonnie. Before that scene fragmented, there were so many efforts that came out as a result, and almost all of them are classics. You know, obviously Derek and the Dominoes being the final act of that. And then what I realized when I laid it all out is that that whole D&B nexus, his work with them was basically finished within a year. That was it. He had kind of went off into another thing. But you had Delaney and Bonnie on tour with Eric Clapton, D&B together. Then that first Eric Clapton album, which I'm not really a fan of that record, but you do have Let It Rain. And I know, again, it's another step in the direction of Mad Dogs. Now let's talk about Mad Dogs. So Mad Dogs and Englishman is the Joe Cocker tour, which he famously showed up completely blitzed out of his mind, exhausted for, and was you know, you probably know hell of a lot more about the mafioso inspiration behind the tour on that one, right? D. Anthony? Right, right. Yeah, there's no real explaining what, how that came about, but, you know, D. Anthony wasn't paying any attention to Joe's need for rest and relaxation. Yeah, they had like eight days to get on the road. And he didn't have a band. And so he left it. He just pleaded with Leon. Leon Russell stepped up and put the band together. Anyone out there who has not seen this film or heard, forget about the double album. Get the one with the double plus all the extras. If it's not the greatest live album of all time, it is certainly in the top five. And an important aspect of his work in his personal life started here which is he starts to do speed balls yeah the mad dogs and englishman tour was where jim really began to exercise an enthusiastic interest in drug use the whole thing was a, a rolling bacchanal but uh in, in jim's case he had an ability to absorb massive amounts of drugs without any apparent deleterious effect especially on his playing his playing never faltered keltner tells the story of jim coming backstage with a handful of Owsley LSD tabs and Keltner breaking off a little piece and taking a little piece of one and Jim gobbling down a whole pill. And then they go out to play and Keltner can't even remember what rhythm is. He can't bring himself to hit a stick on a drum. He's sitting behind his drums just wondering, what am I here for? And Jim is on it. He's playing and he's looking over at Keltner and screaming, play! play <laughs> and Keltner finally just got up and, and and left and burst into tears so there's tons of stories about jim's ability to just consume massive amounts of this stuff again it speaks to his unique electrochemical setup yeah and then is this the first instance where there's any kind of recorded violence against women with rita coolidge the first we know about yeah and it seems to have just emerged out of nowhere on the other hand it's not quite the story that rita coolidge tells you want to relay the it's sorted, but the fact is, is that Jim had been fooling around with another one of the gals in the uh, troop, and she'd left her hotel room key under Jim's pillow, and Rita found it. And she was miffed, and she was riding Jim about it, and bellyaching about this enough that it came to the attention of other people in the troop. They were like, what's she on about? I mean, there's so much stuff going on here. What's the big deal, right? And apparently, this worked up a great deal of resentment in Jim that came out at this unexpected moment where he asked her out in the hallway and, and knocked her unconscious with, with a punch. Now, she says that that was the end of the relationship, but it wasn't. They got back together after the end of the tour. She was uh, living with her sister, who was married to Booker T at the time, and Jim was living in a Volkswagen camper that he parked in Booker's uh, driveway. In fact, when Jim went to London to join Derek and the Dominoes, Rita took him to the airport. Huh, that's interesting. So yeah, she obviously is retrospectively mortified that she stayed with him, as would anyone. So then these guys, they're not Derek and the Dominoes yet, but feeling like legendary figures at this early stage and they become kind of the foundational house band for George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. Jim then went on to play on Living in the Material World and Extra Texture, read all about it. But really his work, I know you're a big fan of Awaiting on You All and How Could You Not Be? You know, his work on this record is nuts. Yeah, those other tracks you're talking about were cut at those sessions. He didn't do any further sessions with George Harrison later. They were just left over. I was saying, you know, that Ringo started out on the drums. That's Ringo on He's So Fine, oh, My Sweet Lord. He had to uh, go to uh, Nashville and, and do some sessions on, on a solo record of his. And when he came back, Jim was on the drum chair and George gave Ringo a tambourine. I got to tell you, man, if it's because of Boku's of Blues, it was worth it because that's Ringo's best solo album. <laughs> when I met I Ringo, that. 
That's what I fucking told them is Boku's of Blues is your best album. Ringo didn't mind. He thought Jim was amazing. And they end up playing double drums on the on sessions there together. Isn't Pete Drake all over Boku's of Blues? Was that what brought him over to George Harrison? Could be. I have no idea. Yeah, obviously an insanely good record. Then there was a Bobby Key solo LP and then Layla. So let's talk about the guys in Derek and the Dominoes. We've got a one, Eric Crapton. Uh, we've got Jim Gordon, Bobby Whitlock on organ, background Vox, Carl Radel bassist. I'm not a huge Eric Clapton fan, as you could surmise from my made up surname. But Derek and the Dominoes is, to me, that's not Eric Clapton. That's Derek and the Dominoes. One of the greatest albums of all time in the top five double albums of all time. When I think of Jim, one of the first things that pops into my mind is his work on Keep On Growing. There's a lot of overdubs on that. Is there a drum over? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. He dumped a lot of percussion on that track. Okay, I didn't know that. So talk to me about the sessions here, because first of all, there's that gatefold where if you look in the gatefold, you know, this is a doomed band, obviously. Even Dwayne Allman passed away after having gone through the ranks. And there's a woman who's on the inside front cover who she went missing in the 70s, apparently. And then Carl Radel died in 1980. Clapton and Whitlock are the only two that made it out of that band. To the degree they did. The recording sessions were held Miami and uh it became an opportunity for the four musicians to uh just saturate themselves with heroin use they had dabbled prior to that but when they hit Miami it became a thing the bags of powder on top of the amplifiers in the studio so it was recorded in a kind of drugged out blitz in a very short period of time like under a couple weeks Almond shows up the third day the producer Tom Dowd brought them in he'd been producing the Almond Brothers band he really sparked a tremendous feeling the band had toured England doing very small halls. Those shows were apparently just magnificent, just incredible. And they went straight from that, like the next night to Miami and recorded this thing in just this blur of drugs and alcohol and music. And when they came back to put the finishing touches on it, Clapton still didn't satisfied with Layla. And he'd heard a piano piece that Jim and Rita had played for him and convinced Jim that they could put that on the end of Layla. Clapton and convince Jim of that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Clapton knew all about this piece, and he knew where it came from. He knew who wrote it. And the final version is a composite of Jim playing piano and Whitlock playing piano. Whitlock didn't care for it, didn't think it was a good piece musically, knew who'd written it, didn't feel it fit on the piece, but he was wrong. And why they didn't put Rita's name on, I can't tell you anything more than they were pirates and she was just a wench. Yeah, there was obviously a lot of blatant sexism in music at that time. But to, to be fair, when you listen to Priscilla Coolidge's version with Booker Jones, which is called Time, it's not even close to the coda on Layla. So I'm glad at least it's on this record because since it's used in Goodfellas, it's kind of seen as sort of the ultimate elegiac piece of music in a sense. And it never ceases to not deliver chills down my spine when it kicks in. And it's that symbol whoosh when that happens always chills down my spine always there's some fantastic isolated drum tracks from layla out there on the internet it's not abundantly obvious how brilliant the percussion patterns and, and what jim's doing on the drums on that track are but when you dial up these isolated versions and you see you were talking about nuance and subtlety yeah it's genius drumming it really is that song is a towering accomplishment but there's not much on there that is less than that heat of the highway is maybe the only song that i would say if you got rid of that i wouldn't blink an eye but uh even that has its place it's a great record all the gigs that i heard them play even though they're on heroin they're sounding like fast and furious on this but the heroin catches up with them by the time they hit the road because everything sounds like a congealed slog by the time they hit the stage do you feel that way i don't think anybody was particularly happy with the performances on the u.s tour although they did get a live album out of it but yeah, Whitlock told me that he kept watching Clapton during the second show at the Fillmore East because he thought the guy was going to fall over on his face. It's really a shame. It's one of the greatest bands of all time, and I've never heard a document that truly seems to have captured them in that kind of white-hot intensity that D&B had on stage. There's still some good stuff from the unreleased second record. So they got back in the studio, right? What happened when they started recording again? What went down there? Well, they didn't have the material. They didn't have the same kind of 
freshness around their relationship. They were all pissed off and antagonized with each other, and uh, they didn't have Tom Doubt. They went in the studio unprepared. They had Andy Johns as their engineer. He's a great set of ears, but he's not an adult authority figure like Tom Dowd. Yeah, the relationships had just deteriorated to the point where nobody could stand anybody anymore. It blew up in the studio over Jim tuning his drums for two hours. So who's the biggest cheerleader of this thing actually continuing? Was it Whitlock? At that point, they all hated each other. They were all out of inspiration. Heroin had destroyed their lives. Clapton, after he walked out of the Derek and the Domino session, wasn't heard from for three years. The Rainbow Gig is the first thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was Pete Townsend trying to get Clapton out of his house. Right. So they broke up for good in 72. I read a quote somewhere. Jim Gordon said, the producers wouldn't pay me for Layla because they said I'd be dead in six months anyway. I don't know if that's true or not, but what happened with that other girl? There was another woman around this time. Chris O'Dell was uh, somebody who worked at Apple and had become involved with Leon Russell. She's the uh, inspiration to his song, Pisces Apple Lady. And she wound up working at Clapton's place in the country. And she and Jim struck up a relationship. Eventually, there was some violent episode just before the tour. He chased her around the apartment with a knife, surprised the hell out of her, scared her to death. And it was only interrupted by somebody just unexpectedly dropping by. And she said he apologized later, although he didn't remember using a knife. And after apologizing, it was never mentioned again. That's that's wild. I wasn't alive during that time. I was born in 72. But uh, around that time, it seems like one of the biggest complications about people being held accountable for their actions is that you had language like that's his bag, you know, don't harsh his trip, things like that, which would allow psychotic behavior to not only occur, but it's a perfect breeding ground for it. One of the things I said in the book about the mad dogs and Englishmen thing was that there's no small irony that amongst these people and all their terrible behavior, they couldn't distinguish authentic psychotic behavior. Right. It just didn't stand out. Right. That's terrifying. That really is. I mean, because uh, Jim's not the only guy or the first guy, you know, to wander through a situation where there should have been red flags hoisted way high up in the air for everyone to see. So the last thing that really went down that kind of of capped the Delaney and Bonnie era is Dave Mason's Alone Together, a phenomenal record. Also one of the most beautiful slabs of vinyl that I own, that speckled marble color vinyl. You like that record, but don't like the Clapton solo record. Interesting. And, th and that record was three hours out of Jim's life. What, Dave Mason? Yeah. Oh, no way. I didn't realize that. Yeah. To me, that feels like on a par with the other stuff. And then Eric Clapton's eponymous thing, it feels super tentative. And frankly, I'm not at all a fan of his solo career at all so to me this is a perfect I'm with you there i think clapton's towing the line of one of the most overrated talents in in rock history the solo career has been largely useless but that delaney and bonnie record that he did with them the live one yeah but i mean what you called the eponymous eric clapton album that's a sound of record as he's ever made the ensemble is spectacular and the material is decent enough i mean really you know he's still singing half those songs the dave mason record it's got a couple good tracks on it. And then again, Dave Mason, he's just like an extremely modest talent and a very limited personality. But that track you're talking about, only you and I know. Ooh, yeah, I mean, like I said, that album's three hours out of Jim's life. That's amazing to me. I love that record. I think it's a five-star record. And the only other thing that I've ever heard from him besides that that I think is awesome is the one he did with Mama Cass next up. <laughs> I, li I like that one. I think that that's underrated. Oh, it's. I'm sure it's underrated because it's not rated at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That is true. <laughs> all right, so 70 to 71 is the rest of Jim's stay in London. So let's just talk about a few tracks and also the other band that he joined because you know he's not going to let the disintegration of Derek and the dominoes hold him back so randy newman's have you seen my baby then he's uh, hooking up with john lennon with power to the people and imagine and by the way i don't like it's one of the only tracks where i don't like jim's drum work is power to the people uh, it I always love that piece that is jim i don't want to say channeling that's jim's take on ringo is it really and oh yeah oh clearly He's going to play with John Lennon. He's going to play like Ringo, only not like Ringo. Ringo couldn't do what he does on that track. Those things are, you talk about paradiddle. 
Those are constantly mutating, cascading drum rolls. It's a fantastic part. The ability, the technical ability on that drum part is staggering. And then the other thing is, it's Jim's vision of what Ringo could sound like. Right. His son- I, I, I think that's one of Jim's masterpieces. That's interesting. Um, I'm definitely going to go back and check that out again, because it's one of the only songs that he plays on that takes me out of the song because of his work. He's crashing on it, and Spectre gives him the mix, which he doesn't always get. A lot of Jim's best work is just buried in a terrible mix. Right. Uh, but Spectre knew what to do with Jim. Yeah, no, I think that record's powerful. I do not think the other track off Imagine What Is It It's So Hard. I don't think that's anything special. It's okay. Is that the only one he's he's on on Imagine? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. A couple other tracks to mention. He's playing with some really high shelf blues guys. BB King in London, John Lee Hooker, we might as well call it through. I'm not a fan of Barbara Streisand, but I gotta say that the song Beautiful on your track list that you put together is awesome. The bitch can sing. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. So, two other things about 71. Nilsson Schmilson, which jump into the fire unquestionably. If you had to put 10 must-hear Jim tracks, that would be on it for sure. He's all over the record, right? Yeah, he's not on Without You. Okay. That's Keltner. There's some Keltner sessions in there, but yeah, he's all over that place. That's him on Coconut, and Coconut's an amazing drum part. Yeah, Coconut's awesome. He's also, of course, was on Aerial Ballet, the soundtrack to Skidoo, Harry, and the Son of Dracula soundtrack. So a definite mainstay for Nelson. But most importantly, he becomes a member of Traffic. I like Low Spark of High Heel Boys. However, I believe Traffic was past their prime at that point. And the song that he writes for that record, Rock and Roll Stew, is definitely not a great song. It's not Layla. Uh, but... <laughs> He provides some really good work to that record, and you can hear Jim on Welcome to the Canteen as well. I'm not with you on that. I think that traffic at their prime. The live gigs were unbelievable, as Welcome to the Canteen makes it obvious. I don't know how many drummers are athletic enough to do nine minutes of paradiddles on Gimme Some Lovin'. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Capaldi wanted to sing. He wanted out from the drum set, and Capaldi wasn't the world's greatest drummer. Jim was. And they threw in an extra conga player and had Gretsch holding down the route. It is the most powerful version of the band. Jim joined them on stage and started gigging with them within a month after the end of Derek and the Dominoes. Wow. It lasted for the rest of the year, so like six or seven months. And that's a big English tour, including the second Glastonbury Fair. There's footage of it on the internet. Nick Rose shot it. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Then they did a U.S. tour. They were phenomenal, and that was their best record at that point. And no it was their best, best-selling record. No way. No, their first two records tower over that, I think. But it's still a good record. It's not where eagles fly. That's a piece of shit. But I think they were slightly past their prime. I love having somebody who's super comfortable with their taste duking it out with me on this show. It's the great. It's Winwood coming into his own as a keyboard player, and the uh, whole band dynamics are just phenomenal. Paved the way for a shootout at the factory with the Muscle Shoals guys. That was a high point for those guys. Was he dismissed from the band, or what happened? Oh, yeah. They couldn't handle those guys. Gretsch was as bad as Jim, and so was Reebok. They were drunken. They were using every kind of drugs imaginable. They are misbehaving in the sort of rock star ways, and that wasn't Winwood and Capaldi. I mean, they put up with Chris Wood drinking because he was really sort of quiet and calm but those guys you know outside of a little occasional reefer and some lsd they weren't really wild and crazy guys and the whole jim gordon rebop and and rick gretch thing was a little bit appalling to them so he was thrown out of the band they were dismissed yeah uh so he comes back to california from london and by all accounts this is a really good period in his life obviously very much in demand as a drummer he became sober around this point sober no no okay uh that's a little a little bit later he does that no he was drinking heavily uh in an effort to stay off heroin i'm sorry did i say become sober i meant became a full-fledged alcoholic um (laughs) 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 so he buys a new house in sherman oaks begins seeing his daughter again and married the singer-songwriter renee armand right renee he met her on uh uh doing sessions on her album they became a couple and then jim sort of took over the production of the album and he plays keyboards guitar he's the producer 
He's written songs on there. That was a creative explosion for Jim. How would you assess his performance on that? It's Jim coming out from behind the drum set. Is that a good look? Yeah. Up, though? Well, the role model was the Carol King Tapestry record, although Renee comes from much more of a jazz background. And the songs, they're more obscure than Carol King stuff, which is so immediately accessible. I don't think the record ever really had a chance. But it certainly opened Jim up as a creative person. And that was something that was going on for him in England. You know, he wanted to write with Derek and the Dominoes. He produced that Bobby Keys record. He wrote Rock and Roll Stew. You know, he was beginning to test his creative abilities beyond the drum set. I do know that there was at least one incident with Renee where he said to her, I know what you're doing. And then he points to three things on the floor and says, the magic triangle. Devil's he, triangle, yeah. The devil's triangle. Yeah, he exploded he on, on Renee and beat her up pretty badly. And, and that was the end of the marriage. It lasted less than six months. Right. Jim was not capable of the kind of intimate relationship that he longed for. It was not in his psychological abilities any more than it was for him to to be a father to Amy. He just couldn't make those connections. Although, like I say, he aspired to very deeply. It's at around this time when his behavior becomes noticeable. The bassist, Max Bennett, said he was always a quiet guy, but the quiet became very loud and everybody left him alone. Uh, so I guess during breaks at work, he would stand alone in the corner talking to himself in a whisper. That's the kind of thing you can't really explain away. Yeah, there was a point where the shyness melded into an uncomfortable introversion and the struggles that were going on inside Jim to maintain his equanimity and, and to continue to function in the real world were just getting more and more dramatic for him. All right, that about does it. A heartfelt discography to thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Joel Selvin, Diversion Books, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and the show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, no sweat. I get it. Just email me at info at discography.com and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the limitless wonders of skewed 1960s hippie living is to go straight to the beginning and listen to Pink Floyd, episodes 1 and 2, The Monkees, episodes 22 and 23, The Band, episodes 25 and 27, The Zombies, episodes 59 and 60, Sweetwater, episode 79, and Burt Summer, episode 83 and 84. Come to think of it, you'll probably want to check out the interview with Don Randy as well, and the David Axelrod Don Randy interview, the number of which escapes me at the moment, but I'm sure if you're listening to this, you're smart enough to check out what number it is. But wait just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. Join us as we descend down, down, down on Discography's week-long back when the drugs were working deep dive. Of course, if you're a Patreon subscriber, then you already know to keep your ears peeled throughout the week because this Monday brings the Patreon-only wildcard episode Alan Arkish's Fillmore Feast 3, the worst bands of the psych era, plus Alan's beautiful friendship with Jerry Garcia. Not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discography's The Top 10. This week's list reflects Jim Gordon most decidedly on the ascent. Again, back when the drugs were working and features the indomitable Joe Kennedy. It's the top 10 sunshine pop songs. Make sure you visit patreon.com slash discography and check out the thematically related deep dive as a music obsessive's way of life. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars because next Friday, August 11th, we're coming at you with the remainder of the Jim Gordon saga. It's part two, lads and ladies, the fall. 
Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. This is true crime mixed with rock and roll at its absolute apex. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Discography.